So good morning everyone uh, in India and good afternoon to our members in Australia. Uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar, COVID-19 Navigating Key Legal and Business Issues. Um, with uh, us and businesses having the whole challenge of having to comply, to cope, to adapt, reinvent and respond, uh, we thought this would be a good time for us to get three of our expert uh, members. So we have six panelists, the three of the companies, uh, who will be talking through these points with you uh, and highlighting various issues that would be relevant to businesses and which would help you to navigate the challenges for, and for you to comply to cope. Um, as you would have seen uh, with yesterday's news, India plans its first ever virtual bilateral summit uh, with both Prime Ministers, Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Scott Morrison looking to deepen Indo-Pacific uh, partnerships and engagement. Um, so with that, I'd like to now introduce uh, our panelists for uh, today. So we have uh, Savita uh, from Kochar & Co. Savita is senior partner. and um, her areas of practice include corporate intellectual property and TNT law. Uh, she's also an Australian um, alumnus, so it's great to have uh, Savita with us. Uh, she's on really legal advisor for the chamber as well. Um, we have Stephen Curtin, a partner Convo's Law Australia. Stephen's practice reflects a career that has its foundation in property and business. He works closely with our corporate with their corporate team on property aspects of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, we have Richard Hutchins, partner Convo's Law or Australia. So Richard has a broad range of experience in advising on construction contracts and commercial construction and insurance disputes, as well as um, many others uh, that he um, you know, deals with and advises companies and individuals for. We have KPMG with us, um, who is a member of the chamber. So we've got KPMG India and Australia. For India, we have Havik Damodar, who is Chief Operating Officer, Advisory Partner, Deal Advisory, KPMG India. Um, so Bhavik joined um, as uh, Chief Operating Officer of the Advisory Practice and also leads on transaction services uh, efforts in the infrastructure sector. And he manages the India-Australia corridor of KPMG India, working very closely with KPMG Australia, which kind of brings me on to Jay Patel, who heads uh, India Business Practice KPMG Australia. So as head of IBP, Jay assists Indian companies with their investments into Australia and vice versa, working closely with partners across both KPMG India and Australia. Um, and you know, it's great to have Jay as well, who's been to India many times and interacts with us. Uh, we have Catherine Dean, partner corporate tax KPMG Australia. Catherine is a partner with the corporate tax practice at KP KPMG Australia. She also holds a license as a solicitor at the Supreme Court of uh, New South Wales. Um, so it's great to have you know such experts with us, and um, I really hope you benefit from this. There will be an opportunity to ask questions during the Q and A uh, section. So we've got about 20 minutes for that. Uh, what we are looking at is uh, first going through the key legal challenges. So for that, we have the India perspective as well as the Australia one. We, we would then move on for the next 20 minutes to, um, you know, to the industry and the business uh, perspective, looking at what the issues are there and what the challenges are, um, as well as how we could help you know, capitalize on the India Australia trade and investment uh, relationship that we're looking at uh, furthering. And then we would move on to Q&A. So do make note of any questions you have, and you can then type that in in the box and we'll bring them up during the Q&A round. So with that, let me hand over to Savita, who is our first speaker. So Savita, over to you, and it's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Petula. Um, Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon to those from uh, Australia. Uh, today's presentation that I'm going to provide is essentially on the uh, India perspective of what are the uh, legal implications since the outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, we have also seen a whole spate of advisories that have essentially come out um, uh, by the government. So um, without much ado, 
what I'm going to essentially in the next 10 minutes provide the perspective is one, these advisories that have come out, come out are these essentially uh, what we call uh, binding? Is the lockdown essentially an emergency? I'm going to also touch upon uh, some of the labor issues that have cropped up since this lockdown has happened and there is an economic slowdown. I will also provide some perspective on the aspects of contracts, what you need to look at and what you need to identify as we move on. There are certain compliances that essentially has been uh, reduced or there are a certain time period within which you need to comply that has been extended and I will touch upon that. So that in a nutshell is what is going to be the presentation today. If there are any questions, we can address it. Do realize that the time is short. So what I'm going to provide is just purely a perspective and an understanding of what has been done. So first and foremost, whether or not the lockdown is an emergency, it, it is not. It is essentially a declaration of the natural disaster that has been uh, uh, under which we have uh, stated that the COVID-19 is an epidemic. So it is not an emergency. So therefore, the manner in which the um, Indian government is deriving its authority is not uh, through the declaration of an emergency, but as a national disaster, which is under two laws that are essentially there. Manisha, could you go to the next slide, please? So if you see a lot number of advisories and circulars have come out since 21st to 25th March, which is the first time that the lockdown had occurred. From then on, we are on lockdown 3.0. Well, uh, we have now opened up, but there are only certain industries that are allowed to function. And essentially, uh, if you see, there are only certain, uh, what you call uh, uh, numbers of persons that are allowed to function also. What was interesting in all these advisories that essentially came out was that there was one advisory which was on the 20th of March that basically asked the, uh, the employers not to terminate employees, not to cut wages, which sent uh, uh, all the uh, uh, employee, employers into a frenzy. So that is one aspect that has come to uh, a lot of the businesses that have been functioning. Uh, next slide, um, promotion. Now, whether these guidelines are mandatory or not, you need to understand that the government is deriving its authority from the Indian Epidemics Act as, far as, as well as the National Disaster Management Act. So the Epidemic Diseases Act actually is a very old act, which essentially was promulgated in 1897. But this act gives a lot of authority to the state government, but not so much so with the central government. The central government essentially would require the state to fall in line, and that is mainly because health as such is a state subject. So that part, they came up with a National Disaster Management Act, realizing there was a gap. And this particular act, some of the key sections essentially, uh, 51 to 60, 72, the fact that they can uh, put an embargo on uh, uh, the movement, all this is derived under this National Disaster Management Act. And therefore, the advisories that they are essentially providing is not to be seen purely on an advisory aspect, but also that it has a binding effect. And if the central government can, it can essentially impose authority on the uh, citizens of India. You will also notice that each one of these advisories are followed by your own state government order or notification. So when the ministry set out a guideline, that guideline you need to see has got the broad based idea that is followed by essentially the notification or the geo of your respective state. And that essentially gives a lot of authority to the state to see that it is essentially imposed, but the state cannot move beyond the advisory that has been put by the government. Next slide, please. Now, when this lockdown happened, one of the uh, guidelines that was put that most of the uh, businesses must go for remote working. Now, there is no specific law under Indian law which talks about remote working or guidelines for remote working that has to essentially be 
developed by an organization with whom they extend uh, knowledge. So what you essentially require to do is revisit your uh, contractual uh, obligations with your employees to see this essentially is addressed. You need to see that you put into place certain checks and balances like timesheets, worksheets. So the manner of the functioning of the employee is essentially the same except from home. So there is a greater amount of duty placed on the company to see that they can tag the employee's performance, that they are able to see what they are functioning from, and they are able to even control the manner in which the employee is working. But do understand that when you do follow your employee, or if you are having the checks and balances, you do not fall into uh, any issues with regard to workplace harassment. So it has to be very delicately dealt with and they're mindful and as well as the policies in place must address these issues. Next slide, please. So one of the key questions that came out once this uh, lockdown happened was whether or not a project of a lockdown happened and then some exempted establishments were allowed to function. Now there's a further opening of some of the establishments. So one of the key things that came out was whether or not you need to collect data on your employees. So first, earlier it used to be whether the employees have traveled. It, uh, it was on the issue of now that whether or not you need to check your employee, whether or not you can actually collect that data and whether or not you can disclose that data. So there are two forms of thoughts as far as this is concerned. Yes, you can collect that data. Two, because of the guidelines, it is mandatory to collect the data. So you need to check your employees. You need to see that those, um, what you call, um, disclosures are taken from the employee. And that is to be retained by you. But in the event you do have a COVID positive employee, you do require to disclose it also in the interest and welfare of the people at large. One of the key um, uh, case laws on this, which was Mr. X versus hospital bed, it could be used as a reasoning here. It was though to do with uh, uh, HIV positive patient. It was also the law that was provided there that the, the right to life also includes the right to lead a healthy life. And that is for both people. Therefore, there is a disclosure of a life-threatening dis disease then it requires to be done and does not violate the right to privacy. But there is another very important issue here. It is not only the retention of that data and the disclosure of the data. There is another aspect as you have opened up that some of the states have uh, followed the um, uh, guidelines of the uh, central ministry of the download of the Arugya Setu app. So the Arugya Setu app which is basically your contact tracing app, there is a binding issue that is there whether or not this particular app will uh, contradict privacy issues if it will any way lead to violation of the right to privacy. So there are two full thoughts on that also. As such, there is again a Supreme Court ruling that has said that you cannot essentially, so there's a test that is put that you can't basically uh, impose the download of an app, especially for movement tracing. But there is also the thought that these advisories that came out from the center stem from National Disaster Management Authority, where there is a section that says it is an overriding effect over all other laws and acts in place. But there is also a counter uh, argument to it that the fact remains the uh, aspect of contract tracing app that has been imposed in India does not derive its authority under any specific law. And um, when we are talking about the national disaster management, it is about controlling the spread of the ep epidemic, which actually is not what the app would essentially do, especially the Arugya Safety app, which requires self-disclosures in order to be able to get this app functioning. And we all know to be pragmatic about it that it's not necessary that everybody essentially will be disclosing this. Next slide, please. The next issue, of course. So if you see when you're an exempted establishment, then you will have 
a huge amount of SOPs in place. Each of those SOPs have changed each time there is a lift of a lockdown. It also varies from state to state. But one thing is very clear. One is the intimation that has to go to the local administration when you start. The second is the passes that you essentially have to take in the manner you have to. Like in Karnataka, you do have to do a disclosure in order to be able to activate. In Tamil Nadu, there is a um, central authority where you can apply for the pass. You can even go to the office now and get yourself a pass. So each state has got its manner and mode in which the passes can be obtained. But yes, each of those factories or establishments have to follow the guidelines. If you are an ITITS working within the um, uh, jurisdiction of Chennai, then you can only work with 10 percent employees. If you're working outside the jurisdiction, then you can work with 50 percent. But you have to get some exemptions done. You have to see that your SOPs with regard to safe distancing, scanning, recording is all in place. So these are additional uh, embargoes that required to be done. Next slide, please. So now coming to one crucial issue that I've already touched on earlier, that because of these advisories which came out that you cannot cut the wages, you cannot terminate the employees, is an establishment allowed to do so? See, even if the advisory stems from an act that essentially says that you cannot do something and therefore you have to follow it strictly, the fact remains you do have existing laws in place that allows you to go about it. So what the advisory essentially said was that do not terminate as much as you can. Do not, uh, uh, what you call, stop paying the wages. If you see even the uh, central government, state government are reducing the pays of their employees. And if you see, there was recently a judgment that was passed by the Kerala High Court where they said that, you know, this was uh, an uh, ordinance that had been taken by the Kerala government. It is in the interest of the state. It was done pan employee without distinction and therefore they did not put the state with regard to the deduction of salaries. Coming to a private establishment, these aspects that you have to do stems from two places. One is if you have employees on board, that is they don't come under the category of workmen, you require to look at the contractual obligations that you have with them. And if you have a worker in place, you have what is known as the Industrial Disputes Act which lays down two very essential manners in which you can deal with this, which is your layoff or your retrenchment uh, provisions. And even if you don't want to go there, you have to give a 21 day notice in order to change any of the service obligations with your work, which also stems from your standing orders. So these are the reference points that you essentially need to keep in mind. Next slide. Uh, picture. So therefore, despite this, you need to take into account they should be applied universally. In the event you are doing any reduction in working hours or working days or pay, you need to enter into the dialogue with your employees. If you are doing work from home and there is an overtime that is payable to the employee, you require to see that they are clocking those hours and you would require to give overtime. So it's not that there is any change in laws. The existing law still continues. Change of slide, please. One of the key things that will now come up is you need to have further obligations as far as the health is concerned. So therefore, your premises have to be clean and sanitized for your employees. If anybody is sick, you would have to give them paid uh, uh, leave, especially if it can be uh, factored that it is because the, you are operating your establishment. It would be advisable if you essentially took also insurance with regard to cover your employees as far as health obligations is concerned. Next slide, please. So this is what I'm essentially talking about. In terms of paucity of time, I'm not going to essentially go too much into it. But if you see, you do have uh, what you call uh, uh, standpoints in your existing labor norms, which needs to be explored, looked into, in order for you to be able to uh, reduce your working population or in order to give any salary uh, cuts. Next slide. Retrenchment is something that is to be followed, which is a fair process, adequate reason. So one of the key things everybody asks, so this is for workmen. 
it is not for a salary waiver. But so would an ITITS establishment come under this? If you see the definition of industry under the Act, that very clearly as well as there are a couple of case laws that shows that there are certain criteria within which if you fall, then you would essentially have to follow the retrenchment process. So therefore, you can't just simply look at just your contractual obligations. You need to see whether or not you fall under this category and therefore follow the due process. You can do anything you require with your uh, working population as long as you follow the guidelines under the Industrial Disputes Act. You use that as a yardstick, then it's very unlikely for it to be struck down. Next slide, please. So these are some of the uh, relaxations that have been introduced. I'm just specifically uh, look, uh, bringing to light some of the corporate, corporate compliances that most companies require to follow. And one of the key things that you will see is there is a settlement scheme that has started for companies and for communities that gives you a moratorium period with regard to payment of any fines or uh, any uh, official fees that require to be rendered by you as well as relaxations of any of the uh, filings that require to be done. If you see, you don't have to hold meetings uh, if it is with regard to the independent directors. The requirement of holding the number of board meetings have been relaxed. There is also a manner of holding your annual general meeting through uh, video recording. So these are uh, some of the uh, compliances that are coming. If you look at your provident fund ESI, ESI, you have a greater a moratorium period in order to uh, submit it. With PF also, there are there is an option that has been provided on the PF website that allows you to file your chalan with no rendering of your uh, uh, provident fund, saying that you will pay it later. But the advice is that you must file the chalan on the due date without uh, uh, any failure to do so. Coming to the aspect of your contractual obligations, one of the key things that has come is whether or not the COVID falls under the future. Yes, COVID can be looked at post-major because it is an epidemic, but your contracts essentially requires to indicate a post-major. And in the event it does not, then you can go under what is known as frustration, which is your section 6, which basically means your contract essentially is impossible to uh, perform. So that word impossibility basically means that the contract comes to an end. So what is important is that when you look at your contracts, you need to see and whether it's your vendor contract, whether it's your lead contract, supplier contract, anywhere where you have an obligation, whether it's to payment or to render a service, you need to see which bucket it could fall into. And accordingly, you can take remedial steps, whether it is to defer the payment, whether it is to say that it is impossible to perform. But please remember that if there is any manner in which you can actually complete a performance, it will be very difficult to take this, uh, uh, what you call aspect. So this in a nutshell is uh, my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, there are uh, what you call a lot of other issues with regard to COVID-19 and with regard to the Indian landscape. But one thing is very clear that each one of these situations that have been pulled out, what we need to do is look at our existing laws and it requires a very, very systematic approach, whether it's our contracts, whether it's our employees to see that we don't fall into potential litigation issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Savita. We'll uh, move on to Stephen and Richard from Convos. Richard, can you hear me? Uh, I think you'll just need to unmute yourself. Those who uh, any of the 
says on mute, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Richard, if you can hear me, Richard, you'll need to unmute yourself. We've got your slide on. Good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, would you like to start first? I understood that Stephen would be speaking first in relation to the temporary laws, uh, bankruptcy, company insolvency, and the issues identified in this slide. So perhaps we could hand to him to start the presentation. We seem to have lost Stephen at the moment. Uh, Richard, could you go ahead with yours? Um, right, I can. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, good afternoon and good morning, respectively. Um, we have only a short period of time to speak about these important issues. So before I launch into them, uh, the first thing I'll say is we're very fortunate in Australia that with regards to COVID-19, the response from government has been quite, on the whole, rapid and effective, which has meant that um, we're in quite a fortunate position at the moment. Although large sections of the economy are shut down, uh, the numbers of COVID-19 cases and associated deaths are quite low, which I think um, is obviously very fortunate for Australians at the moment. So what I would like to do is just go through a few of these issues here today uh, in relation to what laws the government has introduced to deal with these issues uh, arising from COVID-19. If you could please turn to the next slide. The first um, issue that's arisen because of COVID-19 is the fact that um, the shutdown of the economy has resulted in commercial premises, many of them being forced to close. That has meant that businesses have suffered financial prejudice, i.e. their turnover has been significantly undermined or reduced. What that has meant is that tenants have sought to negotiate with landlords for a reduction in the rent. And that's been a real problem that the government has introduced laws to deal with. These laws have been brought in um, at a state level because in Australia, we have a distinction obviously being a federation between on the one hand, the Commonwealth and on the other hand, the states. So the Commonwealth took the initiative and introduced um, a code, a practice or guidelines for commercial leases dealing with issues like when should landlords give rent relief? When shouldn't they? How should those things be negotiated? Those principles were laid out and then the states have introduced legislation dealing with these particular matters. I won't go into them in great detail. Um, there's obviously a fair bit of subtlety as to what leases are and aren't covered and how these principles work in each case. But there are obviously um, a range of measures in different states that apply to these matters. Um, some of the principles um, that have arisen obviously deal with negotiations in good faith to try and come to a compromise about what level of rent should be paid by um, tenants to landlords moving forward. So we could, we could turn to the next slide. Um, that would be appreciated. So that deals broadly with the issue of leases. 
Um, the other issues that have arisen before we get into this slide with regards to building and construction has been in respect of the insolvency laws. These are laws at a federal level that apply broadly to all corporations operating within Australia. And the laws in respect of insolvency have been again changed in response to specific problems arising from COVID-19. Before we get to the change in law, what has been the impact of COVID-19 broadly on the economy? Well, it shut down large sections of businesses. It's closed um, businesses. It's resulted in layoffs of employees. It's resulted in significant declines in turnover of companies. What that's meant is some companies have had real difficulty in paying their debts to other parties. And obviously that goes to the issue of solvency. Solvency has been a key concern. People aren't getting paid in some cases. Companies' turnovers are being reduced and they're having difficulty in turn paying parties that they deal with, suppliers, um, et cetera. So the government's recognised this and has changed the law in regards to the Corporations Act and has reduced, sorry, has increased the period of time that companies have, for example, to respond to what's called statutory demands. Before COVID-19, it was 21 days. Following the changes in the law, companies now have six months in which to respond to statutory demands. That is designed to give companies some breathing space and stop other companies from, and individuals from taking a debt, issuing a statutory demand and winding up companies across the board. There's also been changes to um, the laws in respect of uh, companies seeking to go into some form of administration or um, arrangement with appropriate advice from insolvency practitioners to give them breathing space and relief from being wound up and to give creditors for protection for insolvent trading. So they're matters that have been changed more broadly due to time, I won't say anything more than that. Let's now turn to the building and construction industry and this slide before us now. Um, the good news is that the building and construction industry has not been shut down. It's still operating. There was some uncertainty about that, but things are still moving from a construction perspective. Practically speaking, we've seen a decline in the number of parties entering into new contracts to construct new shopping centres, commercial premises and the like. And the reasons for that are pretty obvious. I'm sure it's quite similar in India. There's a decline in confidence in the market. There are issues with finance. And what we're seeing is the existing pipeline of projects is being finished, but new projects are not being entered into. We're also seeing um, a number of legal issues arising in the construction context. The first is delays to the delivery of works due to supply and other issues. That's causing, amongst other things, obviously the delay and then extensions of time and potentially disputes about those matters. We're also seeking, in, we're also seeing in some cases, the principals and the owners under construction contracts seeking to um, suspend or terminate construction contracts or put them in hibernation to resume them after COVID-19 hopefully resolves itself and when it does remains to be seen. Um, we're also seeing in some cases disputes about whether a contract's been frustrated or whether a force majeure clause might apply to relieve a party from performing. And they're all obviously technical legal issues that are arising. As indicated earlier, um, cash flow is a real problem. And that's particularly the case in the construction industry. We're seeing cash flow being an issue and that's manifesting itself in a variety of ways. Insolvency of parties in the building industry is unfortunately a concern and we're seeing that. And we're also seeing a rise in security of payment claims. Security of payment claims being a way that a construction party has to seek to get paid for the value of the works and the goods it's provided. Um, lastly, and I'll get into this with the next slide, um, OHS, Occupational Health and Safety, is a concern with COVID-19. How do you manage that practically on a construction site? When do you need to shut down a construction site, etc.? What tips would I give you? Well, if you're about to enter into a construction contract in Australia, get some legal advice. Don't just kick it off and think that the contract will deal with COVID-19. It doesn't. Most standard contracts don't adequately deal with COVID-19. I think it's fair to say in Australia and India, 
COVID-19 wasn't something that anyone really expected. It's been referred to as a black swan event. So don't enter into contracts without getting advice and get advice particularly about how COVID-19 should be dealt with, the sorts of issues that I've just referred to. If you're owed money in relation to construction related goods and services, seek advice about whether you should bring a security of payment claim, what your rights are, how you can seek to get paid. If you owe money and you receive a security of payment claim, again, seek legal advice and do so promptly because there's tight timeframes for dealing with and responding to security of payment claims. If your project experiences delays or issues because of COVID-19, supply issues, etc., seek legal advice. <laughs> Don't just assume that you can carry on business as usual. You may need to take action, um, issue notices requesting extensions of time, flag the concerns and the problems, get on the front foot, seek to negotiate with the other side. Lastly, take care when terminating or ending construction contracts. Taking these actions without advice, sometimes even with advice, may cause dispute. So you need to be aware of that. If you have any questions about these matters, um, particularly concerning building and construction, but also more broadly in relation to leasing or insolvency, please feel free to send me an email or give me a call and we'll get back to you. Now, if we could just turn to, yes, yeah, so we're on the employment issues now. I'll briefly cover these, I'm conscious of time. COVID-19, yes. So, just to add that we've got Stephen on. So, Stephen, do you, are you there? Would you like to? Uh, I, I think, I think with respect to Stephen, although I'm happy to be um, rebutted okay. by him, that we've dealt with his section of the presentation. We're now in my section of the presentation. Although, if time permits, you might want to go into the leasing issue in a bit more detail once I've just quickly concluded this part about um, workplace relations and OHS. Is that something that we might do? Yeah, great. If you could then just wind up and then we'll move on okay. to PMG and the All investors. Right. Thank you. Thank sure. So I'll, I'll do one minute on uh, employment workplace relations. As you can see from the slide, um, the government's introduced a job keeper scheme and a um, job seeker scheme. Those schemes are available. There's a fair bit of detail there. If you have a company in Australia, the time to apply for job keeper has come and gone. The deadline was 26 April. There's some information there about how that applies. Um, so I won't go into that. There's a fair bit of information available. Workplace health and safety, um, there's a general law um, in this regard and the state legislation as well. The idea is that um, employers must um, discharge their duty to ensure that the workplace is as safe as reasonably practicable and look after their workers in that regard. Each workplace has particular issues with regards to COVID-19. No one workplace is the same. It's a very big difference between, for example, an office that's a commercial office and a construction site or a, a meat abattoir or whatever it might be. So get specific advice, work out how to discharge these duties and make sure you comply with all relevant government regulations, etc. I might finish up there. If we've got time, Stephen might like to say a couple of things for a minute or so in relation to leases, otherwise we can hand over. Great, thank you, thank you, Richard. So I think we'll you know, leave, leave that for the Q&A if you get any related questions. Thank you very much. I'll now move thank on you. to uh, Pavik and um, Jen, Catherine. So over to you. Thank you, Petrula, and uh, greetings from Sydney to all the participants on today's webinar. Uh, my name is Jay Patel. As uh, Pachula mentioned, I lead the India business practice for KPMG in Australia, and I'm joined today by my colleagues Catherine Dean, who's a tax partner at KPMG Australia, um, and Bhavik Damodar, the um, field advisory partner in my corridor counterpart at KPMG India. So just moving on to the agenda slide, um, we've got about 15 or 20 minutes, and so Bhavik and I thought we'd start off with an overview of some of the business impacts and emerging business themes arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll then touch on some of the business themes more relevant to the India-Australia bilateral relationship. And last but not least, Catherine will then provide a snapshot of some of the key Australian fiscal relief measures to help businesses get through this turbulent period. 
So if we could move to the next slide, please. In terms of the impact of COVID-19 on the business climate, I guess unprecedented times call for an unprecedented response. Uh, and world over, that's exactly what we've seen in terms of government's health policy very much dictating economic policy. Uh, so in India and Australia alike, the government's deliberate and synchronised slowdown of the economy to address the health crises um, has impacted businesses across industries and sectors far and wide. Uh, in Australia, of course, the government has simultaneously implemented uh, a comprehensive range of fiscal relief measures to help the economy bounce back as soon as it is safe to resume activity. Um, and Catherine will talk more about some of those measures in the second half of this presentation. Based on figures released earlier this week, the economic downturn in Australia is costing uh, something like $4 billion per week. Um, and half of Australia's workforce is now on some form of welfare. And so at least at the federal level, there is a growing desire uh, and push to get Australia back to work uh, and, and back to business over the coming weeks, uh, albeit in a staged manner. And that's, of course, to balance up the prevailing health risks with normalisation of society, as well as the opportunities for economic gain in key and essential sectors. Um, according to the Reserve Bank of Australia's latest forecasts, economic activity in Australia is expected to fall by about 10% in the short to medium term, and probably not return to pre-pandemic levels till at least the end of 2021. Uh, in terms of regulatory change arising from the pandemic, I'd just like to highlight that the approval threshold for certain foreign investments coming into Australia has been reduced to zero dollars. So this will really only apply to large and strategic investments which impact on the Australian national interest. And we expect this temporary measure to be in place for about six months, uh, which could result in some delays in the review of current and new applications that come before the foreign Investment Review Board. I'll now hand over to Bhavik to talk about uh, the impact of the pandemic on the business climate in India. Uh, thanks, Jay. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Bhavik Damodar. I'm a partner of KPMG in India and Jay's counterpart, as we just mentioned. So if you look at India, we are uh, you know, obviously a much larger population. We are, we've been in lockdown since the end of March currently scheduled to end on the, the 17th but uh, you know we, we think that there will be you know a calibrated kind of coming back to work or coming back to business in india depending on how the how severe the infection is uh, with respect to the the growth forecast economic forecast uh, we we really haven't assessed the full impact that the uh, lockdown has had on businesses and that will actually become more apparent in the in the quarter or the next two quarters to come. Uh, there will be a fair number of small businesses which will kind of take some time to get back to work. Uh, you know what happens to the wages during the lockdown period? Uh, what happens to you know loan moratoriums? Uh, there has been a three month moratorium. Will it become six? Uh, those are the questions that uh, that remain. Uh, there is also you know, different predictions on what Indian GDP will be. Uh, most predictions uh, tend to suggest that the Indian GDP for 21, because we follow an April to March year, uh, will be positive, but in the very early kind of positive territories, or in the one, two, two, two percent there. Uh, and the way our economy looks is going to change because we are a services economy predominantly. Uh, some part of the services will shift to work from home. So what that does to say office leases and you know large offices is a question. Uh, there will be other structural changes in terms of how factories work, in terms of social distancing, how shifts work, uh, how much of automation we can bring in as compared to being you know uh, largely a labor-driven economy. Uh, so there will be different uh, avenues that will come across in terms of you know new opportunities emerging, but also how the labor force can be redeployed as we uh, kind of go ahead. Uh, we will kind of see these changes as we go ahead in the next few months, uh, but it is likely that 
uh, there will be uh, structural changes on on services and how companies think about having a lot of their services delivered from one place which is india however there is also a silver lining given that you know people have been reliant on global supply chains and a lot of these supply chains have been concentrated on one or two geographies uh, it will potentially kind of uh, be a board level agenda on whether they should diversify and i think there's a lot of effort happening across the world and especially in countries like india on uh, you know how they can attract some of these uh, companies to india as compared to where they are located today yeah if you have uh, anything else sure. on this slide we could cover it or we could move to the next one sure we just we just need to move to the next slide actually okay so uh, bavik's just sort of covered the first two points there um uh, uh, I guess, and, and you know, Bavik's highlighted, you know, some of the fundamental considerations that businesses uh, will need to think about in terms of operating model and supply chain to bolster uh, business resilience as we move into uh, a post-COVID-19 world. Uh, I I just like to add that as, as business. Sorry, Jay. Just on the on the you know on the diversification point, just a couple of points since we we've touched upon it briefly. I think sure. India has already identified land areas or industrial parks which are twice the size of Luxembourg, the country Luxembourg, to be able to uh, attract businesses to come in. There are a host of incentives that are being spoken about, and even if we roll back, say six months, the Indian government has really worked on harmonizing GST as well as reducing the uh, tax rates for companies starting new manufacturing in India in India to about 17 percent which is competitive with any other major global uh, economy that wants to attract manufacturing uh, so these are some of the things that are working positively for India at this point in time and there's expected to be some incentives for electronics manufacturing in India uh, and that should actually help uh, you know some of that shift from especially from China so those are some of the things that are happening. Apart from that, there's a bunch of things happening at the state government level to make land acquisition and other things a lot easier. You have to remember India has jumped over 60 places in the ease of doing business in the last three or four years. Uh, so there is a lot of effort that's already gone in and now it's basically for the government to try and reap some of the benefits of all the good work that's gone in. Over to you, Jay. Thanks, Bavik. Um, um... So look, look, just picking up on some of those points that, that Bhavik mentioned um, for business more, more generally, um, I, I guess as businesses reassess, reevaluate, and retool or repurpose uh, in a new world, um, they'll need to do that by um, putting the customer at the center uh, and by reference to new and different social behaviors and norms. Um, and that will in turn um, shape both their product and service offerings, as well as the mix of organizational resources and technology that they require to satisfy market demand going forward. Um, and I guess we're already seeing some of this business adaptation occurring uh, in sectors such as healthcare in terms of the acceleration of telemedicine, um, hospitality in terms of new and innovative um, home delivered meal kits, alcohol distilleries pivoting to producing hand sanitizers, um, and with travel and tourism, where we're, we're starting to see new protocols put in place to ensure uh, a safer and more hygienic product uh, and experience. Uh, just, just moving to uh, the final point on that slide around the future of work, I think uh, working from home or working remotely uh, has not only become more acceptable, it's become the new norm and, and, and quite frankly tested at scale now. So. What we're likely to see is, is organizations offer greater flexibility with working arrangements um, uh, or, or employees will otherwise demand it to balance up work uh, and, and well-being. But I think this could um, in turn have uh, further positive benefits on, on two fronts. Firstly, um, opening up of workforce opportunities to a whole new range of people uh, such as carers or, or parents with children at home. And secondly, organizations um, will be able to cast their net much wider and across physical boundaries to recruit required skill sets. So if we could just move to the next slide, please. 
Right, so just um, just some more specific thoughts on the India-Australia bilateral uh, economic relationship. Um, firstly, I guess as, as global supply chains start to shift and realign, and assuming geopolitical tensions prevail, our proposition is, could this just be the juncture at which India and Australia make a concerted effort uh, to accelerate the bilateral economic relationship? Uh, there's commitment, of course, from both sides of government in the form of the India economic strategy and the reciprocal, reciprocal Australia economic strategy, although that's yet to be released. And yes, a free trade agreement or similar would certainly help. Uh, but in any event, our, our contention is that it's now to business and academia uh, to seize and convert the commercial opportunities that have been laid out for trade and investment. Um, and other collaborative arrangements across key sectors and shared interests. Uh, on the point around Australian higher education to India, I guess uh, we've seen online education really take off uh, and, and, and very much become the norm during this period. Um, so Australian tertiary institutions um, should be thinking about reimagining their business models. Um, also in the light of competitor countries such as the UK and Canada, uh, to capture a greater market share. So if Indian reg regulations were to allow it, uh, one idea could be for Australian universities to partner with an equivalent Indian institution so that Indian students can take uh, what is an Australian program um, at home in India but benefit from local Indian input and support. Um, so in other words, um, a model with, which comprises um, integrated distance learning, but with local support mechanisms. Uh, on the point uh, around R&D, I think the present pandemic provides uh, India and Australia a wonderful platform uh, to accelerate collaborative research initiatives, specifically in the areas of health and pharmaceuticals, uh, the environment uh, and sustainability. And in this regard, I am aware that um, an Indian company based out of Hyderabad has already joined hands with uh, Griffith University in Australia to conduct exploratory research into a vaccine for the coronavirus. And there are, of course, um, uh, established mechanisms such as the government's Australia India Strategic Research Fund uh, to support the acceleration of such collaborative research initiatives. Um, Bhavik, I'll just hand back to you to cover off the remaining points. Sure. So I think uh, if we look at IT companies, we already have a, a good presence of Indian IT companies in Australia on the ground. Uh, but as we go ahead, uh, and you know, generally IT companies and the uh, global capability centers in India for a lot of large corporates have been able to cope quite well, even to the you know working from home challenge. Uh, but the question remains, and this is an early kind of emerging thought, is will Australian organization uh, you know, look to onshore a little bit more of their ID support so that you know, they have a little bit more resilience locally? And also the people who don't offshore anything, is there an opportunity for them to look at you know, building resilience by offshoring or working with more offshore partners to be able to have some of their processes being delivered out of the country so that if a pandemic were to hit uh, or a natural disaster were to hit one country, at least you got uh, your operations, which are slightly more decentralized to be able to run them all around the clock. Australian super funds have done a number of visits uh, to India uh, and they've kind of, at this point in time, been largely public market investors. But with the Indian government looking to push infrastructure creation to create jobs and you know stimulate the economy uh, and also support uh, small and medium enterprises, do we think that uh, the Australian Super Fund should be looking at India more aggressively? We think probably yes, because they normally trail the Canadian uh, pension funds by about 24 months, and it's been much more than that in this case. Uh, and there are a lot of safer. Uh, you know, methods of deployment of capital like Invits, et cetera, which have been developed, uh, which have actually had a lot more uh, commercial acceptance uh, and have been demonstrated to give steady yielding uh, returns. So we think that there will be a lot more activity here. Uh, and I briefly covered the, uh, you know, the ease of doing business and how India is trying to attract more manufacturing. 
and australia is not a huge manufacturing economy but it does source from different countries and you know can some of that sourcing move to india we think that could come in in the months to come if you could move on to the next slide please uh so catherine over to you uh and uh, you know ha happy to take questions as we go along Thanks so much, Bhavik and uh, Jay. I'm just going to briefly cover an overview of Australia's fiscal measures in relation to COVID-19. And in the interest of time, look, um, I'm going to just focus on the largest of those measures, which is our JobKeeper wage subsidy scheme. So in total, the Australian federal and state governments um, have announced over $330 billion of COVID-related fiscal measures. 130 billion of that is relating to the JobKeeper wage subsidy scheme. I might just go to the next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so the aim here of this scheme is to benefit over 7 million Australian jobs. And um, the payment is actually $1,500 per fortnight per eligible employee. Um, the scheme runs from 30 March until 27th of September. So it's a six month period, depending on what happens with COVID. So around uh, almost a million businesses have actually expressed interest and about 400,000 have already registered. That was as of last week. So um, it, uh, it, it's been well taken up by clients. Might just move to the next slide, please. So just briefly, um, there's a bit of detail here, which I think the slides will be circulated post-call. Really, to get into the scheme, you need to be an eligible employer and have eligible employees. <clears throat> so the scheme is actually open to both small and medium businesses with turnover of less than a billion, as well as large businesses and those with aggregated turnover of more than one billion. And the aggregated turnover test is applied globally. So it would look at your global operations to see um, whether you get into the 50% reduction in turnover or 30%. A 50% reduction in turnover is required to get into the scheme if you're a large business, more than a billion turnover. And for those small to medium businesses with global turnover of less than 1 billion, you just need a 30% fall in your turnover as compared to a relative period last year. In determining the turnover reduction, you actually then look at the GST turnover on an individual entity basis, generally, um, of the Australian group. So it's quite a specific test and there's a lot of nuances. Uh, I do recommend to clients, if you are con considering or have applied for the scheme, that, that you obtain advice, just confirming your eligibility. Because uh, like any fiscal measure, these are all subject to um, the ATO uh, Revenue Authority review. It is a self-assessed scheme, so um, the ATO will conduct review audits post, um, post uh, the scheme as well. You have to uh, make certain notifications to the commissioner to elect to participate. And the scheme um, originally was closing um, for the first JobKeeper period on at the end of April, but it's now been extended um, until the 31st of May. You also have to not be excluded from the scheme. So one of the things that's had a bit of press here is that um, <clears throat> sovereign entities, including subsidiary sovereign entities, um, are excluded from the scheme. Uh, government agencies um, and where you've got a company in liquidation. You also have to have um, eligible employees. And again, it's been quite political, but um, eligible employees are only broadly Australian residents, permanent residents, certain New Zealand resident visa holders as well. So typically your temporary residents um, are not eligible for JobKeeper. They have to also be full-time, part-time or long-term casual employees. And um, <clears throat> generally um, more, than, um, more than 17 years of age. So look, uh, in the interest of time, that's all I'll cover on JobKeeper. There are a number of other fiscal stimulus incentives which are mentioned on the next slide, but by far JobKeeper is, is the scheme most employers in Australia want to get into. 
if anyone um, has any follow-up questions, please feel free to contact me um, post this call. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And it's and it's Jay here. Could I could I just quick very quickly add? Um, so there are a range of um, uh, you know quite generous uh, payroll tax waivers and um, and concessions um, at the state level, and 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 state government grants to help um, businesses keep the lights on during this this period. And um, so businesses should should look into those as well. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bhavik, Catherine, and Jay. This, uh, you know, that was a great overview on the business side. We now move on to Q and A. Uh, and thank you, everyone. We've got quite a few questions here. I'll start off with uh, the one for. Um, I think this would be more for Bhavik and Jay. Let me just read that out. Um, Okay, so this is from Natasha Jha. How Australian businesses can be distinctive and differentiate themselves from other developed economies when engaging in the Indian market? So any innovative models there? Um, Bhavik, did you want to take that one? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, from, from an Australian perspective, uh, uh, I think it's important in India as much in terms of understanding the regulation uh, as much as it is kind of building trust with the partners because a lot of Indian businesses are run by you know families or promoters. So I think building that trust early on uh, and engaging with with the kind of owners of the business becomes a pretty important uh, criterion in my view, uh, and that's how the the partnership will uh, flourish and also. Looking at India, not only saying that, you know, look, I want to supply to India or I want to use India as a chain to supply locally, etc. But how can you and thinking slightly larger in terms of how can India supply to a region or the rest of the world? Uh, that could be an important uh, thought that businesses could kind of have so that it excites the Indian counterparts a lot more uh, as compared to being a very localized uh, business. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, we have another one. Um, is there any move for a financial sector partnership, including regulatory cooperation between India and Australia? Um, so I think we've uh, we've spoken about the India economic strategy for Australia. Uh, that covers some areas of collaboration and how we should, uh, you know, work on these. Uh, if you ask me, is there a financial services uh, collaboration there? Not likely at this point in time, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's an evolving situation because a lot of banks are in, you know, both, both parts of the world. Uh, and there are, you know, different discussions on fintech and many other sectors. So it's not, it's not beyond imagination that there could be some tie-ups. Great. So I'll, uh, one more question um, on that, which uh, has come in, which related to, you know, KPMG. Um, okay. So what could be the right time to place an order from India? Is export activity open in Australia? Uh, Jay, I think most probably for you. Um, India into Australia? Exports from India? Is that the question, Patula? From Australia to India, export activity, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so look, um, based on um, information I, I, I have seen coming out of uh, Australia in particular, you know, there are, you know, the Australian government um, has, um, you know, embarked on initiatives to ensure that, um, you know, the freight corridors are opening um, and that, um, you know, you know, you, you know, there is air traffic that is, is able to get Australian exports um, uh, to key uh, Asian markets. So that's, 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 that's very much happening. Joe, one more Already. question before I then move on to the legal questions. Um, and this has come specifically Chair, what's holding back these specific superannuation investors from investing in India? Well, um, I know there has been some, but I think the question is why is it there? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll actually let, let Bhavik respond to that. 
So I think, uh, you know, with, with superannuation investors, the question has always been saying, you know, what's the return that we can get versus the country risk and other risks that we have to consider for a country like India. Uh, and, you know, you have to understand that superannuation investors have been international investors, but largely to more developed markets where they see a lot more kind of certainty, though the yields are lower and they can understand the risks better. Uh, and it's it's a question of a few investors. And we've seen some of those cases where people have come into, you know, some uh, direct situations, some in which kind of situations uh, and have now started to understand the market better. There's been a lot more presence on the ground. Uh, because India is not easily connected to Australia. And I think presence on the ground is important when we're making large investments. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of more of that happen in terms of at least the visits. Uh, and then, you know, people graduate towards investing in funds like NIIF and then slowly that graduates to more direct investment. So that, in my view, is, is what the progression has been. And we expect the progression to be much quicker going forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, we do have a few more questions around that. And thank you to those who have sent your questions in. So what we will do is we'll try and get an answer for you for your questions from the panelists. Uh, we'll now move on to the legal aspects. We have a few questions on that. So I think, Savita, this is for you. Is false measure accept, accepted in Indian contracts? And is it enforceable? Um, and uh, so, well, so that is, that's one of the ones. And just to confirm, COVID-19 pandemic is not a FM event. So if you can just take that in one question. Okay, so post major definitely is acceptable in Indian contract. And so you can have a post major clause, so therefore it's enforceable as far as contract is concerned that you're going to do. In the event you do not have a post major clause, you still have the contracts act which allows you to be the argument of frustration, which is an impossibility to perform the contract. So post major definitely is allowable and acceptable as an argument when you are unable to perform a uh, type of contract that you have signed. Uh, as far as the epidemic or pandemic is concerned, yes, this also is a post major event. So most clauses that are essentially drafted, which was pre-pandemic, uh, were uh, more focused on acts of board, governmental act and authority, and therefore uh, very few clauses actually will have the mention of epidemic. So there is an argument that has been led by that when you look at acts of God, an epidemic can be brought under that. And when you look at lockdown, you essentially can bring it under the aspect of governmental act or authority, which basically could render your performance. See, the idea of uh, basically the, uh, examining this totally depends upon the contract that you are executing. Because if you look at real estate contracts in India, the, you can't essentially implead that I will not pay rent because during this time uh, there is an uh, epidemic and therefore it's forced me to pay. What you can essentially implead is that you would get for the payment because nothing as far as the epidemic is concerned has stopped you from making that payment. But there are counter arguments to this also. But in a nutshell, FM event is definitely allowed, and a pandemic is also considered to be an FM. Okay, so we'll wind up with one more question to you, Savita. Are organizations required to issue any directive to their employees to download the Arogya app that's come out? If so, what is the obligational liability of the organization issuing such a directive? See, if you see how the guideline has essentially brought out the Arogya Safety app, it's considered to put into place in the SOPs that you want your organization to follow. And uh, it is also uh, to be seen whether the states are allowing this. If you see in Tamil Nadu, the guidelines have not provided for the Arogya Safety app to be downloaded when you look at the SOPs. But uh, it is there, if I'm not mistaken, in the Delhi guidelines. So therefore, one has to see whether or not the guidelines have been provided. And if that's the case, if you want to go down that road, then you would have to issue the directive to your employees. But see, like I said, this is a very, very, uh, what do you call, uh, open-ended question because you have a privacy issue that is in line and you also have a directive that has come from the government stemming from an act that gives it the authority to give. So if you choose not to follow that directive, 
then in the event you receive a notification from the government, then you do have to be ready to respond to that on why you're not allowed for the uh, app to be downloaded. So there are two sides to this. Thank you, Sabita. So there's one, uh, I'll, well, this is the last question and there's one for Richard and we'll wind up with that. Uh, there are more questions uh, and of course, uh, the last question we'll take, but there are more questions just to clarify and we will get answers for you from the panelists. So Richard, for you, is, um, is the construction industry in Australia heavily dependent on Chinese investments and how can the Australian market diversify? That's a good question. Um, I think it's fair to say that the construction industry in Australia has Chinese investment in it. Um, it also has Spanish, European and investment from around the world. Um, in recent years, last five or ten years for example, uh, lots of international um, construction companies have bought into construction companies in Australia just by way of one example. Um, so it's not just China, so I don't think that the construction industry in Australia is um, overly reliant upon China for investment. Um, certainly there's been a fair bit of uh, investment by Chinese um, companies and entities in development in Australia, which is another um, issue, but not the one that's been asked about. Um, I will also say, and it's not directly to this question, that there is a fair bit of reliance in Australia on overseas produced and supplied goods. Um, and that's something that obviously has been looked at. It's been looked at through a variety of lenses in the current context of COVID-19. Um, the impact on the supply chain has meant that construction companies and businesses in Australia have had to stop and say, well, should we be importing these goods and materials in the way that we are moving forward from countries like China? Because with issues like this pandemic, the ability to secure supply has been in some cases jeopardised. Um, but we've also seen that issue come up uh, more broadly um, as an issue of, in some cases, quality um, of materials being uh, supplied and obtained from overseas. But going back to the question, um, I don't agree with the assumption or proposition in the question. I don't think the construction industry is currently in Australia overly reliant on China. Um, in terms of it from an investment perspective, but I do think that there is a connection in particular with, with goods coming from China and that's being looked at because we've seen projects um, being unable to continue because of the inability to obtain um, the basic materials and we're seeing the resurgence of manufacturing in Australia, America and other countries partly in response to these concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for that. Um, so we, in the interest of time, I think, uh, you know, and thank you to all of you who are, uh, who have joined us today. Uh, I hope you've really found this useful. Thank you for your questions. I assure you we'll get you answers for the rest of them. And we'll send that to you individually by email next week. Um, on that note, I want to say thank you very much to all our speakers, our attendees. Um, you know, thank you, Sabita, Stephen, uh, Richard, Parvik, Jay, and Catherine. Uh, I think there was, uh, you know, that was a great effort in getting us uh, that overview on both the legal and the business side in so short a time, but it definitely gives uh, all those who attended something to think about and uh, get back with any questions uh, and they need your expertise on that. Um, so on that note, thank you uh, to Abhilash and Manisha as well for coordinating this um, webinar. And on behalf of the Indo-Australian Chamber of Commerce, thank you for attending. The webinar has been recorded. We'll send you the link as well as answers to your questions. And until our next webinar, have a great day, everyone. Bye then. <laughs>